the June 19th meeting. Do I have any comments? Or? Somebody uh, move to accept them? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that the minutes of the June 19th year 2001 meeting be accepted as presented. The motion's been made. Is there any second? Any uh, questions or all those in favor, please show by raising your right hand. Minutes are accepted for the June 19th meeting. We have in front of us uh, a great deal of correspondence, and I will list those at this time. We have a letter from Mr. Ballou and C. Kane regarding St. Bart's subdivision. We have a letter from Mr. and Mrs. McHugh regarding Mitchell Road. We have a letter from Moulton regarding St. Bart's subdivision. We have a letter from G. Stein regarding St. Bart's subdivision. We have a letter from the town attorney regarding the building envelope setback. And we have a proposal from Gulf, Gulf Crest property master plan. We have a letter from the town attorney regarding MC Associates lawsuit. We have a memorandum from the police chief regarding the Gabriel, Gabriel PAW. We also have received a letter from the town manager, Michael McGovern, regarding our issue on the uh, historic resource program. We have a letter. Um, from a William W. and Robert Benaney regarding the Blueberry Ridge project. We have a letter from David Campbell uh, regarding the Blueberry Ridge project. We have a letter from Christopher Bolus regarding the Blueberry project. At this time, uh, we'd like to get into our first new, budget, new business project, the Gulf, Gulf Crest Boardwalk Amended Site Plan Resource Protection Permit. Steve, if you'd. Good evening, I'm Steve Harding. I work for OST Associates. I'm also the uh, town engineer for Cape Elizabeth. And uh, hopefully we have a, a very straightforward request for you from the town uh, regarding the construction of a uh, boardwalk at the Gulf Crest parcel. Uh, what we're asking for tonight is an amended site plan approval and a resource protection uh, permit to construct a eight foot wide boardwalk approximately 65 feet in length over an RP2 wetland. Uh, just to orient yourselves uh, with the project, this is a colored rendition of a plan that's in your packet. Uh, this is Spurwink Avenue to the, uh, the upper side of the plan. We have the public works facility right here the two recreational fields in the parking lot here. And then the area in blue is the limit of the wetlands that are on the site and the remainder of the parcel. Uh, basically what we're proposing to do is construct a boardwalk across this narrow area here so that we can connect both sides of the, uh, of the uh, wetland area. Uh, that area right now is being traversed by people. It's, a, it's not a stream, but it's always a very damp area. Uh, people are walking through it. And recently, uh, people have laid down branches and pieces of wood to try to uh, facilitate this crossing. And what we're proposing to do is build something very similar to a boardwalk which you, you approved and we uh, constructed behind the public works facility. And there's a, a picture of that in fact. Um, if anybody has any specific questions, I can try to answer them for you. Uh, hearing no questions, uh, I'd like to make a motion. 
be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts submitted, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for an amendment to the previously approved site plan and resource protection permit for the Gullcrest facility located at 10 Cooper Drive to build a boardwalk <coughs> 8 feet wide and 65 feet in length across an RP2 wetland be deemed complete. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Motion. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, show by raising the right. At this point, we consider it complete. Mr. Harding, you want to continue the discussion at this point? Well, basically, what we're hoping to do is uh, have the contractor who's cleaning up some loose ends uh, at, the, at the public works facility and the recreational field uh, complete this project, uh, this work as part of their overall scope. And uh, we're hoping that we can get an approval for tonight, if that's possible. Are there any uh, questions that the board might, or issues that they'd like to discuss at this time? Mr. I have a question for the applicant. I'm, maybe I missed it while I was just bringing my materials up, but could you give us a little description of, of the sort of overall destinations that this uh, will facilitate. Well, what we're when trying you look to do. At the map, there looks like there's tons of trails. Yeah, and that's, some that's, of them are some of them more important than others. Well, that's one of the problems that we've had right out with the with the parcel overall. Um, and in your pack, you'll see a proposal uh, recently. The council approved the Greenbelt Trail, and as part of that, uh, there's a master plan that we're going to uh, investigate to to look at the trails and the inventory of, of trails that are out there. Uh, when we per when the town purchased the property. We had a list of some trails and some new ones have been cut by some uh, citizens of the town through the parcel. Basically what this does is it connects an area that's already being used by people that go out here. Uh, there's an area of, of trails in behind the, the public works facility and this also loops across the boardwalk and then continues on down through the transfer station and if you continue walking on that trail and you know where you're going, you can get out by the treatment plant off the Spurwick Avenue. Uh, this will also facilitate uh, movement of, of people across this area to the, some existing trails that are around the athletic fields. Uh, and there also are some connections down here. What we'd like to do with that master plan, rather than come to you piecemeal and look for boardwalk crossings, is to study the whole parcel and potential connections to the town center and come to you with a comprehensive package that would, uh, that would address those type of connections. Thank you. Steve, I had one question, if I might. The boardwalk, um, as far as the stormwater management, with that boardwalk on there, will that inhibit any high water from hitting the bottom, or does it raise it high enough so that it just flows? Yeah, basically what happens is all the drainage from the public works facility and the majority of the playing fields comes down in this area. It's, it's a very wide open meadow, and then it narrows through here and this wetland area is, is very wet, but it doesn't have a stream channel. And basically what we're doing is, is putting it, elevating the boardwalk on sections of utility poles so it would be up above the ground level uh, by at least a foot in that area over the, the entire expanse. So it shouldn't have any impact at all about the stormwater, with the stormwater from the site. Any other questions or comments? I hear a motion. Motion uh, for approval, findings of fact. One, the town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan and resource protection permit for the Gullcrest facility to build a boardwalk eight feet wide and 65 feet in length across an RP2 wetland. Two, the plan substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan standards and section 19-8-3 resource protection standards. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for an amendment to the previously approved site plan and resource protection permit for the Gullcrest facility, located at 10 Cooper Drive, to build a boardwalk 8 feet wide and 65 feet in length across an RP2 wetland, be approved. I've heard a motion be made. Is there a second? Second. 
Motion's been made and seconded. Are there any comments or questions at this time? Hearing none, I'll put it to a vote. All those in favor, show by raising your right hand. The motion carries unanimously. Second item on our agenda this evening is a request by Joseph Prestacci for amendments to the previously approved Rosewood, Rosewood subdivision located off Rosewood Drive and Edgewood Road. The sub, subdivision was approved by the planning board in 1992. The amendments included creating a lot for an existing home separate from land reserved for future development and increasing the width of Rosewood Drive right away to 50 feet. No physical changes to the site are proposed as part of this amendment. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 16-2-5. Amendments to the previously approved subdivision plans. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Joe Pistacci. I live at 8 Rosewood Drive. And as the chair uh, described this uh, amendment request, this was a subdivision approved in 92 with five house lots. The original uh, five were located on this land that is bordered by Mitchell Road, Woodland Road, and one on Edgewood Road. The original, well, there were original four lots located here on a private dirt road 30 foot wide. Uh, since uh, 92, the ordinance has changed and any uh, private roads I understand have to be 50 feet. One of the changes we're requesting is to upgrade, not upgrade it, but to widen this on paper only to a 50 foot uh, right of way in case there are changes uh, in the future. We do not anticipate any uh, it's anticipated that this will remain a private road and uh, will not have any physical changes to it. The reason that we can expand to 50 feet now is because of re recent reclassification of the wetlands. Uh, originally this was an RP1, but a reclassification by a neighbor. Uh, it's been reclassified to an RP2, so I'm taking advantage of that opportunity to ask for an increased um, right of way of 20 feet to uh, bring it up to, to uh, standard uh, or the, uh, what the subdivision ordinance requests now, and that's the 50 feet. Second change is to identify lot four with smaller boundaries. From approximately 16 and a half acres, it's being reduced down to one and a half acre. That would identify that as a separate lot, separate from the cross-hatched area here, which is reserved for future development. This will allow me, um, as the owner of the property, to identify that lot as, as an individual lot and not confuse it with any future uh, development of the remaining parcel. Those are two changes. The third change, which uh, I've been asked to comment on, is the addition of uh, a piece of land that I acquired um, in the last uh, two months, and that is located at 138 Mitchell Road. And Maureen, I don't know whether I'm, I'm overstepping my bounds by including this as a change or not, but um, should, should address that? Okay. Uh, this land here was recently purchased, and that would be considered a portion of land that will be reserved for future development also. Right now, it's an individual lot that had a house on it that burned, but uh, this uh, gives access, additional access, to this future land to be developed. So those are the three amendment changes that I'm requesting to the previously uh, approved subdivision plan of, of uh, 1992. Again, widening Rosewood Drive, a private road, with absolutely no changes being made at this time. Number two, identifying boundary lines, closing it in on lot four, and adding uh, 138 Mitchell Road to the land to be uh, developed in the future. Uh, Richard Manthorn, who's been working on this as a, the engineer, 
is here to ask any technical questions of you. I'll answer any questions that you might have now. Good evening. I have a question about the reclassification of the wetlands. Um, has anything been submitted to the town um, by a soils engineer or a wetland specialist um, you know, as proof to us that it is indeed now RP2? Um, I've just received this through hearsay. Maureen is better to answer that than myself. Uh, what happened was the, if you picture the wetlands, uh, ponds on the right side of the wetlands, there was uh, someone who owns a single family home who went to the building inspector and wanted to get a permit for an addition to his home. Uh, he was told he was in the buffer for the wetland and hired a soil scientist to go out there and map the wetland and then submitted that information to the building inspector as part of his uh, application for an addition. And it was that information that indicates that it is, it is no longer considered an RP2. In fact, both of the wetlands are very poorly drained soils. However, neither one of them meets the one acre threshold. In 1992, when the subdivision was originally approved, uh, in mapping the soils, there was also a stretch of soil that linked both ponds that was also very poorly drained soil. And what is being proposed now is that that link of soil actually is not very poorly drained, but poorly drained soil so that the link is gone, it's under an acre, and everything is now resource protection to wetlands. Okay, thank you. <coughs> everything is now RP1 or RP2? RP2. Uh, Mr. Fusacci, I'm correct then that you're not proposing at this time any type of access through this new lot, and would that be number six? This would be number six. Okay. The uh, land to be developed in the future would be identified as lot six. All right. Lot four will remain the same, this one with the house on it. So this plan does not have any, at this point, any type of access proposed from uh, Mitchell Road, is that correct? No, I'm, this, this is, uh, I'm not here to ask for any uh, access waivers or any of that nature. I, I'm here to identify the widening, a request to widen Rosewood Drive and to identify lot four. This is completely separate um, and I'm not asking for any, uh, as I say, access roads or anything of that nature. Nothing is proposed at this time. Okay, but you're, you're adding that recently purchased lot to the land to be developed portion? Uh, that will be added to it, yes, yes. Um, the, um, requirements on a cluster subdivision uh, is to have all lots as part of our unique one common lot. Uh, Maureen can help me with the language on it. And that is what we're doing. We're adding this to make it a, um, what's the language, Maureen? I don't know. Uh, part of the, um, the, the, part the, of the, the plan, the overall yeah, the, plan. If the board doesn't want to see that lot added as part of this particular phase, you don't have to. It's just that the applicant now owns the lot and had shown on his plan that he owned the lot, but had left the prior property owner on the plan as well. And what the town engineer recommended, and I agree, is that let's just make it, let's clean it all up. And since the applicant owns that lot, we might as well just show it now. If, however, the board is concerned in any way, it can still be shown as a separate lot and eventually it'll be dealt with when the applicant submits their new subdivision plan. Well, I, I think it makes sense since the ownership has changed to reflect the proper ownership on, on the plan. Mr. Fritzdachi, could I think you've explained this once, but could you explain for me again the, the reason that you want to widen Rosewood Drive? I mean, you're not planning to actually do that now, just you want to reserve your right to do that in the future? That's correct. The, the standards for a private road have increased since 92. 
we were able to get away with a 30-foot right-of-way back in 92. Since then, um, the standards have increased, so I figured at this time it would be an opportunity to do so. Uh, what's, what's going to happen in the future is this cross-hatched area probably will, will definitely be given to the town. Um, this portion already has been given to the town conservation easement on it, so we will probably give the remaining portion along Rosewood Drive to the town. So I just want to reserve the um, 20 feet at this particular time as opposed to coming back for an additional amendment change. When we did this in 92, the board at that time said any changes to the subdivision would have to have board review. So we're just trying to eliminate another board review in the future, and that's why we're here now. <clears throat> but it, we expect absolutely no change. We just reserving the right in case these people want to widen it and have uh, a public road. Right now, I'm plowing the road and I'm maintaining it. If I move, if I sell my house and move, I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm giving them the opportunity to have a choice down the road as opposed to not having a choice. other comments? Has there been any public commentary on this particular aspect? Uh, there was a, a man who lives on Rosewood Drive who called me this afternoon and uh, we spoke at length about what widening the right-of-way could mean. Um, he did not explicitly say he wanted an opportunity to speak and have a public hearing, but um, he expressed concerns. Um, actually, not so much concerns, but he was very, very, very curious. Um, I have also received some letters that the board has, but um, most of the comments I've been receiving really have more to do with the new subdivision than with these particular amendments, with the exception of the one gentleman who had some questions about why the right-of-way for Rosewood Drive is proposed to be widened. If I might add, uh, any changes to this road would have to have the consent of the homeowners on Rosewood Drive. It's just nothing that I would do without the consent of the other people. Does anybody see a reason to have a hearing or thoughts or a site walk on this issue? No. Mr. Chair, I've walked the uh, property in the past when the applicant that comes forward with other changes. Uh, I personally don't see a need for a sidewalk or a public hearing. I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, just Maureen touched on this, but uh, for complete clarification, particularly for the benefit of those who have submitted letters um, really uh, meant to address the, the potential future application for the Blueberry Hill subdivision, that what we're looking at tonight has nothing to do with that new subdivision. This is more of a minor clarification. And I hope people won't uh, get the wrong impression that you know, this is a rubber stamp on a new division. This is just changing the potential width of a road and, and, and the realigning some of the lot, the lot boundaries within the subdivision. Thank you. Anybody want to make a motion then that we address this issue? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Carter. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Number one, Joseph Pistacci is requesting amendments to the previously approved Road, Rosewood subdivision located off Rosewood Drive and Edgewood Road to create a lot for an existing home separate from land reserved for future development and increasing the width of Rosewood Drive right away to 50, foot, 50 feet wide, which requires review under section 16-2-5 of the subdivision ordinance. Number two, since the original subdivision approval in 1992, the applicant has purchased an abutting lot from the Lonsdales and added to land reserved for future development. Number three, the application substantially complies with section 16-2-5, amendments to the previously approved subdivision plans. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joseph Stacci amendments to the previously approved Rosewood subdivision 
located off Rosewood Drive and Edgewood Road, be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the plan be recorded by revised in accordance with the town engineer's letter dated 9-10, year 2001, and number two, that the plan shall not be signed and recorded until the above condition has been met. The motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's made and seconded. Is there any discussion? At this point, we'll put it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please show by raising your right hand. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Sir. Third item on our agenda this evening is uh, Gabriel, uh, Suzanne Gabriel is requesting a private access way permit for a new lot located off Cross Hill Road. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-7-9D private access way permit. Mr. Mitchell takes a stand here. Uh, we did receive a letter from Dan Flaherty regarding this subject um, in our mail this week. And I failed to acknowledge that earlier. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Mitchell, Mitchell and Associates. And I represent Suzanne Gabriel uh, for this application of a private access way. The, the property is a 12.5 acre uh, parcel located on Wells Road and it extends back to Cross Hill Road and abuts Cross Hill Road in this location here. Um, Cross Hill subdivision abuts the north and east property lines uh, Wells Road to the south and to the west, land owned by Springwick Rod, Rod and Gun Club and Boy Scouts of America. Uh, our proposal is to, uh, our application is to uh, present to you a private access way. Uh, we lack the, the frontage on Cross Hill Road is 68 feet, approximately 68 feet. Um, thus, we lack the 125 feet of required frontage. So we are uh, proposing a private access way to, to get that 125 feet of frontage for a single lot of 2.2 acres. Uh, the private access way has been designed, uh, as recommended by your town engineer, um, has been designed in accordance with the subdivision road standards. It's 20 feet wide. Um, it has the, uh, the gravel base section um, and pavement thicknesses um, to meet your subdivision ordinance in the event that this road is extended. Uh, there are no current plans to extend the roadway. Uh, Suzanne Gabriel um, would like to create and convey one lot at this time, but uh, the, the plan has been designed. Uh, the right-of-way, the road, and the utilities all have been designed uh, in the event that the road is extended at some future date. Uh, we have received comments uh, from the town planner police chief and town engineer and we've addressed those comments and I'd like to just uh, take a few, min few minutes just to uh, review with you uh, 
those comments. Uh, the first one was uh, written deed descriptions. We have submitted deed descriptions for both the uh, right of way uh, in lot two. Uh, the maintenance agreement for the road has been signed and notarized and submitted uh, to Marine's office. Uh, I believe the attorney has reviewed this. Your attorney has reviewed this, had one comment, and uh, the applicant agrees with that, that comment. The uh, name for the roadway has been uh, placed on the plan, Cardinal Lane. Uh, the town engineer has, uh, most of his comments are technical in nature, but we have addressed all of them. Uh, he wanted a grading plan at one inch equals 30 feet, which we've um, done here. We've also added a cross section, for, uh, I mean a road profile uh, for the roadway. His second comment was, uh, as, I, as I already indicated, to design this roadway so that it meets your subdivision ordinance. And we've done that in terms of the road width, which will be 20 feet wide, uh, the sub-base gravel, the base gravel, the compaction, the side slopes, and the pavement thickness. Uh, he asked for a letter from the, town, uh, from the uh, engineer, Les Barrier Beach to him. He's the engineer for Cross Hill Subdivision. Uh, we have submitted that letter uh, with regard to stormwater. Uh, one of the, the next comment was sanitary sewer. I think this is something that uh, Steve missed. It was already on the plan. Uh, it was some specification and notes and details pertaining to the, uh, the sewer pumping system. Um, there are notes. Uh, note 8 uh, specifies the type of pump to be used, and there are details on sheet 3 uh, with regard to the uh, sewer. The water service, uh, he asked if we could get a letter from the water district. We have, and that's also been submitted. And the last item was road, the road trench. This was from Bob Malley. Uh, Bob expressed a concern about having one trench uh, across Cross Hill Road, and we agree with that, and we indicated on the plan um, the location of where that trench would be and where the saw cut would, would occur. So all of the, all of the uh, comments uh, have been addressed. Uh, there were, we resubmitted our plans to, um, to Steve Harding, and he had uh, a couple additional comments today, which we agree, they're technical in nature, um, and we agree to do them. Uh, and I guess the last thing is that, uh, as the chairman mentioned, there's been a letter submitted by one of the abutters or across the street abutter. Um, and we'd be glad to, if he's here this evening, I'm not sure he is, but we'd be glad to uh, try to answer any of his concerns or questions. Um, and I realize this is a complete misapplication at this point, but if the, uh, I would request that if, if the board feels comfortable with this application that we request uh, approval this evening. Thank you. At this point, um, I think we need to address the issue of completeness. Has anybody got any problems at this point with that? Well, I guess uh, I'm a little confused. There are a few things that the town engineer is recommending, and I don't know if that goes to completeness or to approval, but there seem to be things the town engineer is asking for, and Maureen, maybe you can tell me if that's been provided or not. Well, yeah, the, the town engineer's comments really are more substantive. He, he felt there was, I think he felt there was adequate information for completeness, but he wanted some changes. Uh, the two things that were identified in your memo was incomplete. One was that the right-of-way description for what is now to be Cardinal Lane um, was, in fact, a description for something off of Old Ocean House Road. So it was just an, an, an error in submitting it. 
Um, if you read it, you saw that it referred to ocean, old Ocean House Road, so it's just the wrong place in town. The applicant has since submitted to me uh, a right-of-way description that actually describes where Cardinal Lane is. Um, under D, the maintenance agreement, um, the applicant um, had had the form that the town used and just had some problems with her computer and getting the thing printed out. It has finally been submitted to the town, has sent it to the town attorney. Um, he spoke to me yesterday and there's a letter from him today that he basically has, has uh, requested that a couple of words be changed, uh, but the, certainly it has been submitted and uh, we have some very clear instructions on what the town engineer's recommendation is for what needs to happen to it so he would consider it acceptable. Does that answer your question? Yes. Regarding completeness? Thank you. Are there any other questions regarding completeness? Can we address that portion of the motion regarding completeness? Then we can get on with the rest of the... Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Suzanne Gabriel for a private access way permit for a new lot located off Cross Hill Road, R5-40-1, <clears throat> be deemed complete. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there any second? Yeah. Motion's made and seconded. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please show by raising the right hand. At, at this point, the completeness is finished. There's, now, if any of us want to get into a discussion on some of the questions that, that may be more, Tony, go ahead. I have a very basic question that maybe I, I'm just missing, and I apologize. But it, is it that the frontage using both lot one and lot two is is insufficient? or is it just the frontage of lot two that's insufficient, creating the need for the action? Just lot two. So is there a way that lot two could have been configured to provide sufficient frontage? No. Uh, Suzanne Gabriel lives, resides on lot one, um, down in the west corner of lot one. Wasn't, was lot two divided out? She also owns lot two, correct? Correct. Was that divided out at one point? No, no. This is a, this is, this is part of our application this evening, is to um, create a lot. In order to, in order to create that lot, we need to have 125 feet of frontage. Right. So why not create the lot so it has 125 feet of frontage? because we only have 68 feet of frontage on Cross Hill Road. So, correct me if I'm wrong, Marine, but we had to create the frontage along the private access way. I think the other problem, John, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but even if you look at the frontage that she has on Wells Road, there isn't enough there. Because the, this, the Gabriel, yeah, the Gabriel lot originally included another lot, and way back in '91, the the Mugar lot, which if you could just point to it would be good. Yeah, that lot and the Gabriel lot were were once one lot, and and Ms. Gabriel had to come in just to get a private access way. Actually, at the time it was a, pro, a public access waiver to create the Mugar lot. I believe the the reason the applicant is doing this is because um, the logical way to create a new lot is to create it off of Cross Hill Road and even if they had enough frontage on Wells Road the way the lot would look would be very odd. I, I guess that's not my, my question. I mean, maybe I'm, I'm missing something here but it, it appears that what we're being asked to do is to approve a private access road to create frontage where there isn't frontage. And in doing that, allowing two lots to have the frontage as opposed to one lot that prior to that would have had sufficient frontage. 
Yeah, I think what you're you're being asked to do is that there's they have 68 feet of frontage on a town road, mm -hmm. and they can either use that 68 feet for the new lot, or they can use that 68 feet to start creating a new private road onto which you can get your pub your your road frontage requirement. But, that but or if it wasn't divided into a second lot, there would be sufficient frontage for the one lot. There still that, would that, not. That's, I guess yeah. that's my question. There still would not be this. This is uh, the RB district, and the, the frontage requirement is 100 feet. So, so I guess that was my original yeah. question. 125. 125. That's right. Yes. So with both lots, I guess that, was, that brings me back to the original question. With both lots, using both of them, would there be sufficient front Using the combined frontages? Yes. Um, I believe I believe that uh, the frontage on Wells Road is 135 feet. But that would, if we, if we did that, that would require a, a spaghetti type of lot. Um, but how about on Cross Hill Road? May I offer a clarification here? Mr. Mitchell, on the drawing behind you to your right, the, the combined frontage of the two lots on Cross Hill Road is 68 feet, is it not? 68 feet is the, the, the frontage that exists today. Ms. Gabriel's property touches Cross Hill Road for a total of 68, total of 68 feet. feet. Both. No, matter, no matter how it's split up, you still only have 68 feet. Before the split. Okay. Well, when I asked the question before, I thought he said lot two was 68 feet. Just trying to keep up. John, just a quick review. Um, the the in, town engineer raised a question about the slope, 5% rather than right. 3 in, in, initially, You have no problem complying with We don't have any problem. <coughs> initially, we had 5% grade. He recommended, <coughs> along with his recommendation, that the road be designed in accordance with subdivision standards, which is uh, 3% versus 5% for a private access way. Uh, we revised the plan to show a 3% for the first 50 feet. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Mr. Chairman, getting back to the uh, discussion about where we proceed now that we've had our finding of completeness, uh, it would be my suggestion, given that we've had at least one instance of public input so far, that we should schedule a public hearing before making a final determination. Any other thoughts on that issue? I would agree with that because it is a relatively large parcel of land, and um, you know people will want to know the future plans for development of that, and we'll have questions about that. So I'd like to give them the opportunity to state their concerns. Would you like to make a motion to include that at this time? Proceed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer the following motion, be it, this is a follow-on to our original finding of completeness, be it further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular October 16th planning board meeting, at which time a public hearing shall be scheduled. Final motion's been made. Is there any uh, second? Second. Uh, motion's been seconded. Um, any comments at this time? All those in favor of the motion, please show by raising their right hand. The motion carries. Thank you. Good evening. Mr. Chair. I respectfully excuse myself from consideration of the uh, next application for personal reasons. Any uh, comments regarding it? Thank you. The final item on our agenda this evening is the uh, 
In by the sea, located at 40 Bower Beach Road, is requesting an amendment to previously approved site plan to allow functions with up to 200 people to be held at the inn. Current site plan approval includes 43 guest room hotel with some small function rooms and a 48 seat restaurant. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Good evening. Good evening, board members. Um, my name is Stephen Moore. I'm a landscape architect with Moore and Sierra in Portland. I'm here this evening on behalf of the owners of the Inn by the Sea, who I told to be here at 8. So I'll have to take the blame for them not being present. Um, notwithstanding that, I'd like to start and walk the board through the information we have coming out of our last meeting. Um, talk to you about where we have some deficiencies in terms of meeting the ordinance, and then talk about a couple of potential solutions on that. Um, as we have indicated in our submission material to you, the Inn by the Sea is looking to secure a permit from the planning board to amend their existing site uh, plan permit to hold outdoor functions in two areas on the site. And the areas are shown on the plan uh, before you. There's one that we call the front lawn, which is the area on the water side of the property in front of the main inn and behind the 300 buildings. And then there's one in the side lawn, which is shown in this plan here, which is on the croquet lawn. And what we've proposed is to hold those functions in those areas because that's where they've been held traditionally on the grounds at the inn. And what we've been looking to is to monitor what's there now to provide a baseline of data to get back to you in terms of the standards that are set forth in your ordinance. And what we had done in our submission was highlight um, the standards and where we meet and don't meet them. And what I'd like to focus on with you are the two areas where we cannot meet the standards of the ordinance under this current submission. And those are in the parking and in the noise standards. What we had done since the last meeting is go out and using um, Tom McLennan from Acoustic Designs up in Newcastle, had done a series of monitorings of the existing events at the inn, looking at acoustic levels from functions at the facility. And Tom went out on two separate weekends and studied the noise levels in um, three areas, which are shown in your plans um, on the small eight and a half by 11, but they were measured at the property line here and here on the east side, and then out adjacent to the road, and then eventually back moving into this area here. And as we've indicated in the submission to you, uh, the standard we were looking at on the application was residential along this property line, public land because of the state ownership of the cemetery nearby and here, and then residential out um, on Bowery Beach Road. And what we found in those noise level studies is in fact that when we started to take the noise readings here, there was one additional reading over here. The background noise of cars starting up in the lot and cars at Bowery Beach Road were affecting the readings that were being taken in this zone. And hence, Tom moved up into here and took a reading in here, which is one that exceeded the decibel standards that are set forth in the ordinance. When we studied this property line over in here, what we found was that this, in fact, was in compliance with the exception of one reading out in this area here, which Tom attributed to actually noise coming between these two buildings right in here. So we were looking at those noise readings and elevations. In terms of uh, your standards of 55 and then 60 on that abutting property line. Can, and can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. Where were the origins of the noise that were being measured? What we had done was we were looking at the noise. We were studying the noise from this event, this event, and then also looking at what this parking lot was generating for noise. Because the traffic in this lot, a car starting actually pushes that 
dB level up as well. You can get um, 65 to 68 dB from a car just starting and backing out of the space. So what we were looking at, there were events going in those two spaces. Um, this one, I believe, was 65 people, and this one was 105 people in that when we were taking those readings at that time. And those are those noise levels that are spelled out in um, Tom's submission to you. And as we started to study this, we went back for that second weekend to look at the noise levels because we did have two readings that exceeded what the ordinance puts forth. Um, and again, what we were trying to do was look at background noise from Bowery Beach Road and try and isolate that. So we were taking readings when we had no traffic on Bowery Beach Road and just internal circulation, music from this source, and then voices primarily from this source. Um, under the INS regulations, um, this is acoustic music only, and this is acoust acoustic with some amplification. What we then did with Tom was look at the solutions in terms of we're exceeding the limits. We know we've bumped through what's allowable in terms of decibel levels uh, at the property line, notably this one here, and then this one closer in. And as we've indicated in our submission to you, what we think has to be done, what's being recommended, is that we actually have to build uh, a fabric and frame acoustic shell, primarily in this location, but we're also going to put one in this location to make sure that we can drop below uh, the levels that are set forth uh, in the ordinance. We think the only way to really um, know that these are going to work is to actually design them, build them, put them in place, try them, and go through the whole reading process again, and then submit those back into you. That's the only way that we can see um, that we can accomplish that. We have one other event that is closing out the rest of the year. And um, if the board wishes, we can do a temporary installation of that fabric cloth and take another set of readings to determine if, in fact, what we think is working will, in fact, work. Uh, the couple things that Tom uh, looked at were placement of the music source, orientation of the music source, both of which he felt were optimum in terms of keeping this noise deflected out um, and away from these residential uses. So our take on this was, given those two readings, we do need to put in place those acoustic dampening measures. And Tom is working on a design for those right now. Um, and as he, as he indicated in his letter to you, he's anticipating a 5 to 7 dB drop from those couple of um, interventions, which he calls dobos, or gobos, go-between um, panels. And um, I guess what we're looking for the board uh, to consider on that is the reading levels that we have, the estimated 5 to 7 dB drop, and then the measures that we need to take to um, satisfy you and the town that, in fact, we can bring that down, because we believe through those measures we can do that. The backup to those, if those two measures, those acoustic shells, don't work here and here, the second measure to consider is baffling in the tent. Tom has suggested that what's happening out here in terms of noise is that the tents are actually capturing some of the noise up in the upper volume. And because of the type of fabric, it's actually reverberating and causing a little bit of amplification. So the second measure, if we still don't get the reading, in particular right here, low enough because of that acoustic baffling and this acoustic baffling, is to actually hang baffles like you see um, in auditoriums up in the ceiling to drop that noise level down and again refract it, break it, and soften that so it's not actually acting as a bit of an amplifier in the tent. So we have those couple of measures. We could model those. Tom was willing to um, use a computer to model those, but um, my experience on it is I think we're better off actually putting those measures in place and field testing them rather than modeling them. But again, I'll look to the board for guidance on that. I have another question on the noise issue, Mr. Moore. Would, would it be possible, uh, I would like to see 
what the noise levels would be, especially at the property line where the residence is located if the side function area was not used but only from the uh, front function area. Uh, I suspect that music or whatever noise coming from the side function area would have much more of an effect on the residence property line than would the front area which has a building in front of it and is much further away but it would be interesting to see that. Um, I can have Tom break that out. That one spike that shows up in his readings for this reading right in here, he was saying was coming between the buildings. That one spike he attributed to that front yard function rather than that side yard function. We can break that out and show that to you so you understand what that noise source is. Um, but I've spelled out in the submission to you what Tom has put forward as his information and where we think we can intervene with those um, dampening devices to knock that noise level down and make it conform with the ordinance. The other piece that we focused on is the parking. Um, as we set forward in our submission to you, what is on the site right now is 102 or are 102 parking spaces in the parking lots in here. What the site plan was approved for was 106 spaces, which included the 102 parking spaces here, and then four parking spaces on the lawn here, that the so-called tandem parking spaces that sit right in here. The inn manager's house has its own driveway and parking associated with it. Um, in our submission to you, we spelled out what the existing parking was, and after our workshop, <clears throat> went through a series of studies while the functions were in progress, counting the in-guest cars, staff cars, and uh, function guest cars, which is the information that's in the package that um, you saw in our submission. And I have an enlarged version of that. What we found out there is that, in fact, in that afternoon, even though there are uh, 43 guest rooms, on average, our highest average number was 22 registered guests, three in the restaurant, and 10 staff. So we had 35 vehicles at the end in the afternoon. And the afternoon, um, as we set forth, is about 12. We started counts a little earlier than 12 and ran through four. And what we were trying to determine was, what's the real use of the inn during the midday because we were exploring the shared parking concept. And we kept ending up at that high end at 35 vehicles. We then went through when there were a couple of events in place. There were three events that were run at the time we had put this chart together to look at the number of um, parking spaces that were being used by uh, guests of the function. And in that time, we had events that ranged from 130 combined between the two areas up to 188, 86 function guests and six staff. So they were generating 56 spaces. That was the real use out there. And the thing that we couldn't understand um, was that we had the functions going, we had the end going, and there were still vacant spaces, which I think I indicated to you at the workshop. It just didn't make a lot of sense to us why we had vacant spaces um, in the middle of a Saturday afternoon. And I mean, that's a real count. We had one time when we found that 91 vehicles, and then later in the day, on a separate weekend, we ended up at that count of 104 vehicles uh, because we looked at it much later in the day, which we found that, in fact, the in-staff guests and restaurant had pushed that base level up and we had fewer vehicles on site for the function guests. So we were looking at these, trying to determine, can we in fact um, fit the number of cars on the space to support our function guests? Maureen, or should I say this that very nicely pointed out, it doesn't matter what that count is. Let's go back and look at 
what the ordinance requires. So I've taken this, and actually I have this in miniature form. We've taken our parking count and gone back through what the ordinance um, requires for parking so that the board can understand application of that section of the ordinance to this. The restaurant, the 43 units, the employees, and then our internal meeting room spaces. Um, put the requirement at 81. Uh, one of the important things that we did on this was we went back and looked at the rating of the room under fire code versus the rating of the room under your ordinance in terms of one space for 250 square feet. And then we used the higher of the two numbers from making sense to all of you. So that the 40 and the 12 generate the 52 function gets that have happened inside again. So we arrived at 81 spaces um, are the parking spaces that are required. If we keep our function level at 200 people and the supporting three staff, we arrive at 134 parking spaces as required under the ordinance. And no matter what we do on the site, we can't get to that number. We just can't accomplish that number. So we clearly can't support the 52 guests, function guests inside the inn and the 200 people outside on the lawn function areas. Uh, so what we did is I went back and talked with uh, Maureen McQuaid and Susan Legg at the inn about the realities of what this is and spoke with uh, Maureen as well, Maureen O'Mara, about the options for uh, looking at a text change for ordinance and then going back and going through a, a much more detailed parking study on site. We've been pursuing both of those in terms of understanding the time sequence of what it would take to get a text amendment. At the same time, we've been doing ongoing parking lot studies at the inn, hour by hour, at, since the time we submitted on August 30th till now to understand our parking counts. And what we arrived at in terms of that shared parking concept is that no matter what we do with the shared parking concept, we still outstrip the inn's capability for on-site parking with the 102 existing spaces. So, we've arrived at another thought on this, and I'll pass this out if I can find it in my material. And the thought is that Maureen will like this particularly. Rather than trying to fit the um, function to the inn, let's look at our available parking and pull back the function to the size of what we really have for spaces that are out there. And the only way that we can come close to uh, meeting what's anticipated, excuse me, coming close to the parking house is to look at what we have for parking on site, which are the 102 spaces in the existing parking lot and the four spaces over at the innkeeper's house. So what we have right now in terms of paved spaces, 106 spaces at the inn. We take the required spaces of the inn, we take the required spaces for the innkeeper's house. So of the 106, there are really 83 spaces um, that are dedicated for the uses under your uh, ordinance. What that really leaves then is strictly the 23 spaces for uh, the outdoor functions. If we take that forward at the ratio that we've been using, which is both supported by the ordinance but also supported by what we've been finding in the parking studies on the site, that number right there supports 92 function guests, outdoor function guests, as the maximum size. On our parking plan, we've been showing that 20-car parking lot as a valet parking lot. Um, as uh, Steve Harding has pointed out, when you actually go out there and lay those parking spaces in, there's some shrubbery that interferes with getting the 20 spaces in. We've gone out and actually laid it out so there's 18 spaces. So if the board were to consider 
the overflow parking behind the innkeeper's house on that lawn area at 18 spaces, we arrive at 41 spaces that are available, which even at the best, if we take that 41 spaces and push it forward, we're still really throttled at about 150 guests for the outside function. So what we've arrived at as a conclusion on this is that um, we really have two options that we're looking to the board to uh, give us guidance on. One is to simply pull back our guest count so we keep that function level down to 150 people maximum for those outdoor functions. And to do that, the board would have to then consider that 18 spaces, that temporary 18 spaces um, that are talked about in our submission. Or go back and seek a text amendment and come through the board and through the council to get approval for off-site parking. And again, what we're looking at for that is what we talked about in the uh, earlier submission at workshop, which was the Inn has been talking with St. Bart's and has the ability to make an arrangement up there for something in the teen or 20 spaces for off-site parking. Uh, but again, there's a distance there in that uh, St. Bart's is a little better than half a mile from the Inn and it would require a text amendment. So I think we're looking to the board uh, in terms of some guidance and direction. Our feeling is that we can make this work if the board would consider the 18 spaces on site and the end would pull back that function size to uh, 150 uh, function guests in terms of that outdoor space for um, the level rather than the 200 that's in the application before you. So that's one issue. In talking this through with Tom, I'm going to jump back to noise now. In talking this through with Tom in terms of the noise levels that 150 generate versus 200, um, Tom McLennan's feeling was the number of guests is not going to affect that, that noise level. That once you get over about 40 or 50 people outdoor on this site, whether it's side yard or front yard, you're going to see the same kind of noise levels because the spikes are really coming from the music more than um, the voices themselves. The other thing that um, Tom looked at in terms of the 150 guests was uh, the allocation on the site. And Tom didn't feel that the difference between having a restriction on side yard um, would make a tremendous amount of difference in terms of that noise level. Again, because of the, the music source on that side um, property line. So what he's saying was, the way to control noise level here is put up the screen, allow that music to occur, but whether this is 40 or 50 or 60 people wouldn't substantially affect that, that noise level. So I know I've thrown a lot back at you in terms of additional information. I've summarized those three charts um, for you on that one page. But what we're looking for from the board is consideration of what we put before you in terms of the basic information in terms of site plan, and then some detailed discussion of concerns or thoughts on the noise levels and the proposed um, buffering that we've got um, from Tom in terms of that solution to pull that noise dampening down. And then some discussion about our proposal of pulling the guest count down and using the 18 spaces on site. The reason we're considering the 18 spaces on site and would ask the board for that consideration is we feel that that's a much more manageable situation for the inn. It keeps the traffic off Bowery Beach Road and allows the inn to really manage um, the size of the event by its own on-site valet parking sources. The other standards, the other issues that I talked about briefly and are covered in the submission are things like runoff and compaction and trash. And they're fairly straightforward because of the fact that this has been an ongoing use at the end. And this came about, this hearing came out, this application came about because of the complaints of a neighbor or two and the fact that in checking the 
uh, original permit, the outdoor functions weren't specified in the permit. The inn has been operating under the assumption that, in fact, they were permitted. So we're back before you specifically to ask for that. But the only things, again, that we felt um, more attention and focus were the, the noise and the parking. Final note, in your submission from Bill Bray, you'll find his letter about traffic and access and egress in which he found that there was not a critical rate factor, high accident issue in the front. Um, he did recommend, and I hope you saw this over the past few weeks, that that parking not occur in that front lawn, and that has been eliminated. I did notice this weekend there was a truck out here. So we have to um, manage that. Steve Harding, in his submission, indicated that it would be important to get that noted on the site plan, and obviously anything we need to do on that issue we'll follow up on, but um, Maureen and Susan embraced that right away, because obviously they, they're self-regulating in terms of issues like safety and noise and parking. So I don't think that's an issue at all in terms of um, eliminating that parking and properly noting that and then policing that. So with that, um, Maureen and Susan did arrive, so they're here to answer questions. I know I've touched over lightly and just focused on the two issues that are of concern, but I turn it back to the board. I have a few questions. Uh, Maureen, let me ask you, first of all, is the this four occupants per car some type of industry standard in terms of parking? Because uh, the doesn't one, one's in our ordinance. Is yeah. that what is in our ordinance? The, the For an outdoor function, we would assume four occupants per car. What I, what we did um, prior to 1997, our ordinance, our whole provision for parking was this long. And when we rewrote the ordinance in 97, we actually flushed it out so it's now several pages long. And the standards in there for number of spaces per type of use are based on national standards. Um, looking at that list, I picked areas of public assembly as being close to the kind of functions that the inn is operating. And that's the number I used. And you, certainly you can go through that list and you could say maybe that doesn't fit well and maybe we should use a different category. But um, normally I don't do parking calculations for applicants. And so I, that, that just, I just grabbed that one. I, I just, I mean, in the real world, that would mean that as an average, if two people came in one car, then six people would come in another. That just doesn't happen. Um, so, number one, I'm concerned that for safety purposes, for true parking purposes, these numbers are low to begin with. In other words, more spaces would be needed for, for that number of people if this was categorized correctly. That's just my view, because I, I think four people per car is, is probably not a realistic view. Uh, my next question is, w would I be correct to assume that if only the front lawn space was permitted for outdoor functions, you would meet the current ordinance in terms of parking and, and noise level? Uh, yes. That maybe. Yeah, maybe. If, if, in fact, without the overflow parking, is that setting aside the setting aside the overflow, overflow parking overflow and using parking. then the 23. Um, what that would mean was that if this were permitted here with current parking, that would be functions of up to 80, 92 people. Because, and again, uh, this is my last point, but looking at concerns, I'm a bit concerned, first of all, the fact that the inn was never permitted for this sort of use and has done it, to me isn't a, a factor that weighs in its favor, but rather says to me that the abutters that live there counted on the fact that whatever permit was issued did not allow that, and now they're being asked, though it was done without the permit, uh, you're basically coming back and saying, well, that's what we wanted to do from the beginning. And given that context, 
the side lawn and activities on the side lawn, both from a noise perspective and, and just in terms of being right on top of the property line, to me would seem to be more of a uh, concern or a hindrance to uh, property owners that are, that are on that line uh, and also creates the need for more parking, which isn't there and so forth. So my concern is both the number of parking spaces and the effect uh, on the abutters given the proximity of that uh, area for outdoor, outdoor functions, which is why I asked about whether it would meet the ordinance on just the, uh, the front lawn area. If I could respond to the board on the issue of the, the parking count. We didn't go in and just pick out four because that was what was in the ordinance. When we were doing our counts, we were actually separating the function traffic from the guest park, the function parking from the guest parking. And what we found was that the actual number was like 3.96 to 4.12 guests per vehicle. That's real counts based on real functions going on there in that um, 86 to about 105 people on site. And then we went back and asked Bill Bray to look at the Institute of Traffic Engineers manual. What do you have for outdoor functions? And that's how we arrived at the, at the four and it's what we put forward. So that wasn't, we, tried, we went first to the factual basis of how are people arriving and how many are on site. I believe that part of that number reflects the fact that on those two events, or two of those events, there were registered guests at the inn that went to the outdoor function. In one case, there were seven guests of the inn that went to the outdoor function. So their cars were counted as guest cars, not function cars. And I'm not trying to be cute. It's just no, we're I'm trying to be accurate sure. and understand how we get to that. Because when you stand out there and watch them arrive, the cars pop open and two or three people hop out. So that's, we didn't go to a manual and pull that number out. We started with an actual count and then backed into what does the Institute of Traffic Engineers say for parking uh, Earlier, you mentioned the possibility of erecting those sound buffers and then doing a study once they've been erected. I think that would make a great deal of sense. I don't think I'd be comfortable approving a plan based on an anticipated reduction. Uh, so I, I would echo your uh, sentiment to proceed in that manner rather than uh, the theoretical uh, approach. Um, the other issue that I raised to the town planner is I think if we were ever to do a site walk, I'm not sure I want to sacrifice uh, Saturday evening when there's a function going on at the, the end, but that would be the best way for us to, to uh, see the issues or hear the issues of, of noise firsthand. Can we park? <laughs> We're not allowed to invite them, are we? <laughs> that doesn't work. We need not be invited. No. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair. Karen. Perhaps this is a question for Maureen more than Steve, but um, on overflow parking, are they required to adhere to the landscaping, you know, five foot buffers, or can they be more flexible and leave it planar? Uh, the site plan standards say that, that you get to look at buffering entirely around the property and you get to look at the uses. So, yeah, you, you could apply the buffering standard. Um, my understanding is, though, and please correct me, Steve, if I misstate this, but uh, I believe that the parking, the buffering, excuse me, along the property line where the tandem or valet parking is proposed was originally designed in concert with that neighbor. So I'm not sure that, that there would be any, I think the neighbor had actually talked about what they wanted for buffering and there was some concern about not planting anything that got too high. Um, so I'm not sure that that area where the park, between the parking and the neighbor is an area that there would be a need for more buffering or would even be supported by the neighbor. But yes, you can look at that. In fact, 
the original neighbor, Mr. Rautenberg, had a specific design in mind, and as Maureen said, we designed that around that. But there are a couple of gaps in here because the Rautenbergs like to sit on their deck and look over at the end of the inn. This is a new neighbor. Mr. Rautenberg's gone. So there are some gaps in there. And I'm not sure that the, they, they're here. So I think the issue is, as I've been discussing this one with Maureen, um, the neighbors have been out or not available. So if they had specific concerns, we could incorporate buffer and planting in there if that were necessary. And I'm also con concerned about the view from the street, um, and I don't get a good feel for what's there. I mean, I, I don't think a site walk is necessary. I can go look at it. But from the street, is this you know huge mass of cars parked tightly going to be visible? The reason we've chosen that location is it is screened by the manager's house. We're trying to use the manager's house as a foil so that as you drove by on Bowery Beach Road, you'd see this one side of the vehicle. So we're trying to screen that and hide that between the house and the fence on that back corner. So we've thought about that visual impact versus parking in a tandem fashion through here. This tandem parking that was on that original approved plan just it never worked. It just it doesn't work on an ongoing basis. The only way it works is really a valid parking. But we did cite that behind there and chose that because of its functionality, but also because of the screen. Thank you. And I just have a couple of questions about the events themselves, and perhaps they're better answered by Suzanne. Um, you indicate in the application you will be closing down the events at 7 p.m. Is that a change from what you've been doing in the past? Did they used to go later, and are you now saying they have to end by seven? Could, could I have you step up to the mic so that, that it gets, please? Can you have to identify yourself? So you 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 oh, I'm Susan Lake, in by the sea. Um, we used to, back about five years ago, have them stay later, but since we've had, you know, issues with guests and clients and Alan has called us in the past, uh, we stopped having them so late. So now we usually go till about six and we have seven o'clock is like the major guideline. Okay. So if we have to have people stay later than that. And in terms of number events of events per season, you indicate um, you typically have about 30 per year, um, most of them probably in the summer. Um, you know, how many weekends are there in the summer? 14. Um, does that mean you have an event every Saturday and every Sunday? There have been concerns from neighbors that, you know, that's their time to relax and the noise is disturbing to them. Um, can you tell me about the pattern of... Uh, most of the events happen on Saturday. Not very rarely do we have an event on Sunday. So they mostly happen between the front lawn and the side lawn on Saturday. They happen generally uh, from about May 15th to about the end of September. So it would be June, July, August. So it would be about four months. So it would be times four Saturdays, about 16 to 20 times a year. Thank you. I had one other question. I'm a little confused, and you might be able to address this. When you have a function and you're suggesting that you re limit it to 150 people, is that per function or the total of two functions? I think we talked about the total of both functions being 200 ish. Okay. We had, but that's in the seating. What we're saying is both when functions couldn't exceed 150. 150 because that's what the. Conceivably, the you'd have a function on the side lot next to the cemetery. Well, I and, think with those numbers, if you have, we have to reduce them, we probably wouldn't be able to do more than one function because okay. most of the weddings are average about 75 to 100 and 100 to 125. Okay. So if we have 150 for a limit, then we could probably just do the front lawn okay, or side you. lawn. But. Mr. Carter. Mr. Chairman. Susan, when is the next scheduled function at the end that will be using the outdoor facility? Uh, what Saturday. is the date? The next one, Saturday. Mm -hmm. this, this coming Saturday. What time will it happen? Um, one begins at noon. The other begins at 1. And the numbers of the people involved are both those functions? There's 94 and 115. And could you explain to me where you came up with a total of 15 staff members on hand uh, when these functions are taking place? 
Um, I'm just looking at a 43-unit inn and a 48-seat restaurant and 200 guests at a wedding. And as a former well, hotel and restaurant have... manager, I don't think I could handle it with 15 staff members. Um, in the food and beverage department, you mean? I mean, it's just in, in in your parking allocations. You're saying during these functions, there are 15 staff members on hand, or 15 spaces allocated to staff members. That, that's the important distinction, Susan. That right. in terms of the parking spaces, what the inn has been doing is requiring their staff to carpool. So there are 15 spaces that we know are actually used by the staff, but the staff count, I think, has ranged up to 22 or so from the information that we have. Thank you. We have about four of our staff that don't drive, which is probably one of the reasons why the numbers were down or lower than. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Um, if I if I heard you correctly, if the number was limited by the parking to 150, did you say that you would only use one <coughs> site for? Uh... Normally the weddings outdoors are anything beyond 65, otherwise they're inside. So the numbers would have to be 75 to 100 and over. So if we had a limit of 150 uh, and our front lawn group was 125, then I couldn't very well have another function outside. So it would end up becoming either upstairs function or it would not be existing because I wouldn't be able to accommodate them. Okay, thank you. Now, what, let me add one thing is we only have had, I think this is four weekends uh, this summer that we've had two functions going on at the same time. Normally it's just one per Saturday. And it may be on a Sunday we'd have a small function, but. We haven't had too many over this course of the summer where we've had more than one in one day simultaneously going on. Do both the function areas support the same number of people? In other words, do you tend to have the larger functions in front of the inn? And the the front lawn accommodates um, usually 150, and the side lawn goes uh, no more than 100 to 100 and a quarter is your max. Generally, the, person, the, the weddings with 100 groups go to the side lawn because it's a smaller lawn and the larger groups will go to the front one. This is more space. Okay, thank you. I, I did have a couple of questions and a, and a comment. Um, one of the things I wanted to clear up here, yeah, this is a rather complex issue for all of us, but um, we were expecting to get a, a note from uh, the, the code enforcement officer tonight, but I thought Maureen might be able to comment that on that just to get it on the record. Um, I did speak to the code officer about the septic system, and um, he will provide you with written comments. Uh, he just won't be for tonight. Uh, but his feeling was that he was aware of the septic system, and, uh, and he's going to look at it again, but it should be adequate for the proposed uses on the site. What we submitted in the package was the original design flow and um, I believe the state approval at the 20,000 gallon per day flow rate, which again reflects what's been happening there in terms of real flow. I just thought it was important to get that to you tonight rather than wait. Um, I, had a, I had a couple other questions if I could get them answered, Mr. Moore. Um, as far as the as the noise readings were concerned. Uh, I just want to clarify one thing, and that is the instrument that was used, he referred, the gentleman that did the testing referred to it as, a, as DBs, but is it true that he was measuring that with an A-weighted meter? Correct, and if, okay. if you need that, I can get him to write that up. I asked Tom to put that in the memo, but he didn't include. Okay what the actual instrument was. But I can have them include that. And I have one comment, um, and it, I think we'll probably discuss it further, but I, from my position, I would think a permanent in installation as a site barrier 
uh, to reduce the noise at the lot line of permanent installation, uh, I would consider that a, a more adequate solution to the problem than something that's put up and taken down for each event. Um, I would be more comfortable uh, to see that address, but um, that's, that's my position, and I will be happy to see the test results that you have and the testing that you plan to do in the future. I think that's um, something that other people on the board are interested in seeing, and I would certainly be too. Um, I, I do have a little bit of a concern relative to noise on the side lawn function area being so close it is, as it is to the lot line. And that's an issue that, according to our ordinance, uh, noise levels have to be maintained at the lot line. And you are very close to the lot line, so I'd like to see a little more data on that. And that would concern me. Even though it isn't close to, as close to, the res to a, a resident as, as one of the other sites that you tested, um, I do think that it's important to address that issue with a lot line, regardless of where it faces. Right. Any other? How does, uh, I've heard some comments about site walk. <clears throat> Is that something that you, uh, as a board, would want to do? Um, visit the site to get a better feel for it? Um, Mr. Chairman, I've got a, another point of confusion. I'm not sure if this is the... I'm, I'm trying to get a mental fix on this, and, and it, it appears that a lot has happened since you folks came to workshop, and we're in a position now where we have a formal application, and since it's an amendment, there's not even a determination of completeness. It's sort of, do, you, do we agree with this or not? Uh, but it seems to me your proposal is still sort of being flushed out. You're talking about different types of acoustical treatments, permanent or temporary. Um, you're trying to finalize here before our eyes what your parking arrangements are, uh, potentially limit the number of guests that you can allow at a function. So uh, it seems to me that this hasn't been given enough time to really be formalized to your satisfaction as well as to my ability to, to understand it. Uh, and I would suspect that there will be an opportunity for public comment on this before we before we have a vote anyway. Is there a mechanism available to us to give these folks a chance to flush out their proposal a little better rather than be forced to, to rush to judgment? I think, if I, if I might, Chair, I, I think our issue this evening was to put those couple of solutions before you and get input from the board. It's been our expectation that the board would put this forward to a public hearing. That's been our expectation based on comments from the staff and your comments at the workshop. So we weren't expecting formal action on this this evening. No, but um, I guess what I'm saying is, um, and I think you're right, a public hearing, in my view anyway, is appropriate, but uh, exactly what is the proposal that's being evaluated and for which we're submitting public comment, and it seems to me it's still a little bit fuzzy, or have I just missed all the points of clarification? I'm not sure missed points of clarification is the right way to phrase that. Um, we had two issues, and I, I was seeking board input about which direction the board was more comfortable with, the text amendment versus limiting the function size to the 150 and using on-site parking. That was the one question. We've, we've come to that conclusion that it's either one or the other, and, and we understand that. So that piece we know. What we said in our submission was that we're convinced that we have to put in those acoustical measures in order to pull those noise levels down. And my comment to the board was, the consultant said I can do a computer model. And my response was, I don't think the computer model convinces anybody. We need to do either a temporary or a final installation. And what I heard the board saying was, at least one of the board members saying they'd rather see the actual results. So we have an event coming up, so we would put that temporary baffling system in and then go through the readings this weekend to see, in fact, 
are we accomplishing the 5 to 7 dB drop and then restudy those property readings. So that's, that's what I heard coming back from the board, that there's not a level of comfort with just the thought that the acoustical expert is saying you can lower 5 to 7, but do the temporary measure and then get us an updated report on the readings. If, go ahead. Well, before we leave that point, if, if this temporary measure is going to be in place this weekend, I may, if there isn't an, an official site walk, I would be interested in just going out on my own to, to hear it. Uh, I, I can read all these studies and see all these numbers, but I, I think it would be useful for me to actually go out there and check it out in person. I, I think uh, it seems to me that not only does it, is it appropriate for you to do that, but you would want uh, that data and have had the opportunity to present that data to the board before we solicit public comments. So those who are commenting have got the full facts before them as well. It presumably will either help your case or you'll conclude you need to do something else because you didn't get there on the noise level. Correct. Correct. So as I hear your comments, you'd like to see this uh, possibly tabled to the next meeting but not have a public hearing at the next meeting have them come to us next meeting with further data so that we can discuss it. And then the data will be on the table for a public hearing at a later date. Knowing that that does delay their, their timing somewhat, um, I still have to say yes. I guess that, that's the direction I'm going. Could I ask a question of um, Maureen in terms of submission for the October That, that submission is week after next, isn't it? Is that, in, is that insufficient time? Well, no, I, I guess my question back to the board was, if we can go ahead and gather that data and make our submission in time for that, does that then allow you to set that public hearing now? And if we don't accomplish that and get that data in, then obviously then we have to move to the next board meeting. The onus is then on us to meet that, that schedule. I have a question, Maureen. Your opinion, is that time enough for the public to review this data and, and be comfortable for a public hearing on the 16th of October? Under the ordinance, it's supposed to be enough time. But the problem sorry, that we've had in the past is that um, it is usually the board that makes the determination about whether sufficient information is now available to hold a public hearing. And if you assume that the applicant will be submitting information in time for the October meeting. What you're doing is you're putting staff in charge of determining whether or not adequate information is available to schedule that public hearing. I guess it's my opinion that we need the data from this weekend's noise levels um, with some of those measures already implemented, I think, before we have that data ready to give to the public. So I guess I would support, you know, coming back again, giving us more data, um, and then having a public hearing after that. Any other comments regarding? I, I think I concur. I do concur with uh, Karen's sentiment. It seems like, and with uh, Andy's, there's a lot of uh, flux you know, even hearing it regarding this plan, and I, I think it would be useful for everyone if we uh, had another hearing, tabled this until the next hearing, and then had a public hearing the following month, which would be November, assuming everything was moving forward. Would someone uh, be pleased to make a motion to that effect at this time? I guess I just have one further question. Um, have we reached a consensus that, uh, as a board, we're comfortable with the parking calculations? Um, I know there were a lot of questions surrounding it. Um, again, do people plan to visit the site before they make that? But I'd like to help the applicant determine, okay, at least I know the number of spaces we're working with is acceptable to the board. Um, what, what do people feel about that? Um, I can make one comment. I'm, I, if I understand you correctly, you will reduce your function to 150 people. At that point, you'll be able to comply with the on-site parking. Or you feel you will be. 
that's the only way we can comply with the standards is to pull our function size down. <clears throat> but the, I, I think the issue is <clears throat> on the parking is the comfort level the board has with the proposal to put those 18 spaces in that area behind the manager's house. I mean, that we know we can support some function because of that available space, but that 18 additional spaces behind the manager's house allow that to occur. You, you might have covered this, but does that, does that change the noise equation at all vis-a-vis -vis the abutters? Um, I honestly don't know, but that's a good thing to have Tom look at, so we can put some cars in that side yard and look at that. Well, I, I guess, Karen, to answer your question about comfortable with the parking spaces, uh, to me, to, to base a decision spaces on a the fact that you know there's four people per car or assuming that some of the staff doesn't drive or assuming that some people may stay in the hotel that are also attending the functions um, I, I think is is not a conservative way to look at what the potential maximum amount of cars might be at a, at a function. So I'm not totally comfortable with the numbers as, as given that 152 guests would generate that number of spaces um, uh, in, in any instance. And I, I think that's what we have to plan for, not assuming that some people might also be staying at the end. And, but perhaps they might, but unless that's a requirement of our permit, uh, that could very well not be the case. Don't we also need to, I mean, I, I share that same concern, uh, but don't we also need to balance that with, at least considering they do have some empirical data that suggests that four person per car number is accurate for the functions at which they've, they've done head counts, and can we hold this applicant to a standard that's above and beyond what's currently in the zoning ordinance? which, as I understand, the ordinance says use a calculation of four people per car. Well, I, I think that's an interpretation of the ordinance as to whether this is a assent public assembly. <laughs> uh, okay. And so that, that may or may not. May not and I, you know, what I'm getting at is just a, 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 an issue of fairness. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. In, in regards to the parking, this is, uh, I sympathize with the staff, management, and ownership of the Inn by the Sea. Uh, difficulties with managing parking spaces is not the fault of the people who advertise the destination resort. I mean, the American public, in my point of view, is, is mentally ill when it comes to use, use of their car. Everybody has to be in their own vehicle, and everybody must use their own car. And... Uh, I think four, four per car is just not accurate. Uh, and, and again, it's not the fault of the applicant. But uh, I'm going to reserve all judgment uh, on parking and what is adequate and isn't adequate. Do I take a drive by the site on Saturday and do a windshield survey? I, I don't think it's fair to comment any further until at least the majority of the board who may be in town that weekend has the time to do that. I have a motion. Are we ready for a motion now? I'm ready. Uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and material submitted and the facts submitted, the application of the Inn by the Sea located at 40 Bowery Beach Road for an amendment to the previously approved site plan to allow functions up to 150 people be tabled to the regular October 16, 2001 meeting of the Planning Board. Chairman, I'd like to second that motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any comments? Might I ask the board for one point of clarification? There are a lot of standards within your ordinance that are going to be applied to this. The topics of discussion I have focused on noise and 
parking and in some measure landscape it seems like those are the three areas that they're charging us to focus on to get the additional information back am i correct in that i'm not saying the other items won't be discussed but in terms of our submission information the board is expressing the concern of those two items and then in some measure the landscape provision i guess that sums it up for me with the possible exception of you know any difference of opinion between the code enforcement officers evaluation of the waste disposal and you know what the state of maine previously granted thank you i'm comfortable with your assessment i would like to make one other comment that that i think the in by the sea has been a good neighbor and i think that they will probably work hard to comply with whatever we come up with at the meeting. And, and, uh, I think I'll keep that in mind myself personally as Thank I you. move through this procedure. Are there any other comments? The motion's been made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please show by raising your right hand. The motion is carried. Thank I suggest you. that you uh, keep in touch with Maureen as you usually do. We will. <clears throat> At this time, if there's no more business uh, before us this evening, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. That's it. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? This meeting's adjourned.